Hey everybody, welcome to Coffee Talk. I'm your host, Deepal Ted. We're gonna have coffee and talk no big whoop. I have a special guest today, everybody. This is my buddy, John Soares, who's not only a writer, a director, a filmmaker, a fight choreographer, jack of all trades. John, it's a pleasure to have you on Coffee Talk. Thanks, Ted. It's you, great to be here. Thank you. Mmm. Mmm. Okay. Oh, it's that's real coffee. It is real coffee. That's good stuff, right? I don't mess around here on Coffee Talk, people. Um, <laughs> I found you, John, on Facebook when you were working on a film called The Danger Element. And I was just like, holy cow, this guy, like, just from the trailer alone, the editing, the action sequences, all that stuff, I was like, this guy knows his stuff. You're actually a filmmaker. And I've worked in the industry for 28 years, and by watching what you had, I never even heard of you. I was like, who is this guy? And so I know it's going to be a, a simple question and it's going to be a long answer. How did you get started? What what got you started in this venture of filmmaking? I um, was born and raised in the same area where like George Lucas was, you know, uh, where American Graffiti, the, the town that, that that film's based on. Oh, no kidding. Uh, Modesto. Modesto, yeah, I've yeah. been there. That's, I... I grew up in that area. I like went to school in Modesto and and did all my grew up, growing up around Modesto. And uh, I grew up on a farm. Okay. So and, are you a farmer? Well, I mean, I guess I was for <laughs> a long time. Yeah. Uh, my my dad still is. Yeah. Um, but I loved movies. Like my parents introduced me to movies, and we watched movies all the time. Uh, eventually, decided that that's what I wanted to do. So was there key films that triggered like I want to do that the first one was uh, was Ghostbusters Ghostbusters yeah I, I don't know Excellent. why I mean it was like I guess I was right at the the right age and my parents brought that they used to bring movies home all the time and watch them and that was one of them and for some reason that triggered something and I got interested in the whole idea of making movies although they didn't understand it there was absolutely like, yeah zero no, they don't, there's no books for it this was before the internet people yeah, what was that, like 80, 82 or something? Yeah. Like 80 or something? I don't remember exactly. Uh, yeah, there was no, you couldn't really find out how to do it. So I, I remember my parents eventually did get a, like a video camera, like one of those, those v, the ones that had the whole VHS yes, tape in it. Yes, uh, And I, I started too. messing around with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's like I, I lived in that town until I was like 25 years old. And just kind of trying all the way up into my teenage years, trying to make stuff, and all in past it, I, I, I made Danger Element while I was still there. Still there, okay. So, uh, but it, yeah, it was um, somebody came along and was like, "What kind of a movie could you make for twenty five thousand dollars?" <laughs> and I, Danger Element was the idea I had. Okay, right. And so I said, "Okay, we're doing that." And we got all the way up to the point where we were filming. I, we, I think I filmed two scenes. Okay. And there, it wasn't working out. Like, the budget wasn't working out, and then the budget got pulled. Okay, now, where did, who are these people with the $20,000? Uh, these it was literally, like, people I knew at, at church. Okay, so they, they basically said they saw the possible, they saw the potential in you and said, hey, this might be a worthy investment. Let's go to this guy. Apparently. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, I, this is the thing is I don't really understand. I've never understood why somebody would be willing to invest money in in a movie out of their own just out of their own pocket and expect a return so i don't imagine that these people expected to get something out of it but they but they want to see something but you said that they you got the money you were in it and then the money got yeah well, i didn't i wasn't controlling the money so it wasn't like it was in my possession or okay like that. so they're they're, they're piecemeal it to you yes like yeah it was kind of like i i would I would sort of itemize everything, and other people would handle that okay, stuff. Got it. And then the whole thing kind of caved in. I mean, it's kind of like what happens here like, in Hollywood all the time. Yeah, and I didn't fully understand it, but uh, we—it was me and, and Justin Spurlock okay. and my other friend Ben Beams who founded the company, and we decided to try to. That that was like 2007. And what was right? the name of this company? It was, uh, West Haven Brook. Now, West Haven Brook was your production company. Yeah. Okay. So we decided we'll try to go around and shop this thing around and like raise the budget ourselves. Okay. So we came up with a couple of different schemes to try to pitch the thing. We we pitched it to 
some of the richest people like in California. And as you would do when you're looking for money. And we weren't asking, you know, comparatively, like we were thinking it was this is gonna be easy because it's like this is the amount of money these people make in interest when they wake up in the morning. Right. Uh, but they didn't want, nobody wanted to do it. I mean I Surprising. guess it's not a I guess it's not a great investment, I guess, but I guess so I guess it makes sense, but we did that a few times, and I started saying, like, I don't like the, where this is going. Right. Because I think a year had passed, and I think I got to the point where I was like, I don't want to wait another year or two years or three years. I'm just going to try to do this. Okay. So we filmed, like, a 12-minute segment of the film, like the beginning of it, like the big opening action. Thing. Is it So is that the stuff I saw in the trailer? I think that's what... You, the first thing you ever saw right. was like that was kind of supposed to be my proof of concept like we actually can do this okay. you know, so. which did it looked spectacular what I saw yeah. thank you and so you're like <laughs> with that you're like look that's proof that I can do this yeah so like we put that out there put that on the internet but, no, but nobody was giving us money so. well we tried to we tried we, we put it out there and then it kind of developed a little bit of an audience like right. we, we had a little bit of help from like the guys at Indie Mogul, I don't know. Some yes, people I know those are, guys. Yeah. So they really promoted the heck out of it. So like a lot of people saw that first segment that we did, and we developed a little bit of a fan base. And then we did another. Uh, we did like a crowdfunding campaign, right. where in the end we raised about I think it was about ten thousand dollars. Okay. And as we would raise the money, we'd make another section of the movie and put it out there so they everybody could watch it. So you were doing it in sections. Yeah. Yeah, like a like a like a series. Cuz that was the only way we could sort of keep the audience, you know, build a little bit of momentum and so That sounds exhausting. And it was very slow. It, and it was there wasn't a lot of it, it, we had these loyal fans who were actually supporting the project, which I was blown away by. Right? But it was so slow cuz it was still not a lot of money. So we were just very slowly would get like an episode or two every year for right. a while and then at one point we got like, we got a little bit tired of that right. and the, the audience was even kind of like you're making this wait so long they're losing interest yeah so Justin and I came up with the ridiculous idea of taking out a loan so I think it was like we took we took out like a twenty thousand dollar loan yes and and we shot the re like the rest of the movie in like two weeks so, you know, we could have shot... The, it kind of shows you how quickly it could have gone. And that's where I came involved. I got involved with you, and I came in that, that way when you guys said, we're going to do this, you got the yeah. $20,000, and you just shot back to back, just like, you were like, yeah. let's do this. And so basically, every, about, every time you were shooting something was next evolutionary part in the story. So you were not just making random trailers, you were actually were shooting your script, yeah, yeah. your feature film. Yeah, I was taking my script, and I would sit down, and I would take a part of it, and I would try to, I would try to, like adapt that part of the script into an arc with sort of a something that felt like a cliffhanger. Oh, so like a beginning, a middle, and end. Like, yeah. Okay. So it was it was basically like collections of scenes, and they and they varied in length. They were like all over the place because it was a movie script that wasn't a series. You know? It's it's funny you say because uh, we were pitching a thing to Sci Fi Channel a while back, and Sci Fi Channel said every time you shoot your show, like we had a script before, like God, it doesn't matter. Every every. 20 or 15 minutes has to be a cliffhanger. Yeah. Because they, 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 they were marketing for television, they said, we want to shoot it like a TV show. So whatever movie structure you have, throw out the window, yeah. it's got to go da 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 and then go to a commercial. It's kind of like you're doing a series of four, like, 12-minute shorts oh. that leave space for... Because uh, I've done some TV, too. Like, I did... Uh, I edited cartoons and, and stuff, and it, everything was like that. It's got you got to hit these marks, and it's kind of like you're making... Uh, almost like a series, even if it's a half hour, it's like a two episode series or, or something. Right. So. so now all this work, and you pitched, you got your money, and you shot it. So you actually completed your movie. Yeah, if we got we after we, you know, I, you, it's arguable whether this was a good idea or not. But it, it worked out. It worked out. But like, uh, we took out the loan, and then we just scheduled this shoot that was going to be about two weeks, mm -hmm. and it was going to be at least half of the film going to be shot in two weeks and uh and we totally did it and that was like that was when we con i got in contact with you yeah, and yes. stuff and and you came out for a couple of days i think to right. to do the 
the, the, the miniature robot character. character. Yeah, I did. I, I played a robot character in this film, and I got to do a miniature sequence, which this day still. It's actually in the trailer with the with the, with the guns popping up and stuff, and that was so low tech, and it worked out. It's like my favorite part of the whole movie. Oh, <laughs> I stop. love it. Well, I just love it. It's like people watch it and they don't know. How you don't. Yeah, people don't get it. It's just like, oh yeah, the guns popped up. Like, no, it was this big, and yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you assume though it's like it's such a low budget. How could you? You didn't. You surely you didn't do it like this. But yeah, that's how we did it. You that's know, how like, I did it old school. Um, now I'm happy to say that all this hard work and sweat, you made it. You completed your film, and it got sold. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that was a long process too because yes, it is. I, I, we finished shooting the movie, and then there were a lot Editing, of post production well, yeah. things that I like. And I was waiting on a lot of things like music. There were certain effects that I did. I did a lot of the effects myself, but there were certain ones I didn't do that right. were complex, and I had to wait for them because they were. Even if I paid people, it was right, still yeah. a favor. Yeah, you know? it's still like, a favor. You just wait for it. Like, I was you know pay somebody like a thousand bucks to do like a, an effects shot, that could have easily cost a million. Right. You know, so I'd have to wait a year or something like that while this person had time to do it. So. I ended up finishing the thing. I got a job in, in Tennessee. So I had to move out to Tennessee for three years. And then it was 2016 was I finally finished the edit. And then last year, the film has been sold into distribution and stuff. So it's been, it's wow. on Amazon. and it's Amazon, people. It's on Amazon. <laughs> it's crazy. Or if you're in Japan, it's like, uh, it's maybe it's on a shelf somewhere. You, oh, this is the... Th there it is. Look at the show. Yeah. I've show the cover. Isn't that awesome? This, everybody, this is the... There it is. That's it. That's the cover. The thing that's so funny about this is that in making a movie, I made a film years ago, and the one thing you always discover really quickly is that they call the artwork on their box is called key art. And the first thing they do when anybody buys your film is they change your cover, they change your poster. <laughs> and John did this. I'm like going, John goes, they put a person that's not in my movie at all. And I said, welcome to the welcome to the club, John. This is what they do. They just who is a, who is that girl? I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> she was introduced to me early on in the process of trying to sell the movie, and I said she's not in my movie, and they said yeah, but but it sells. <laughs> She's hot. Like, all right, somebody might be upset she's not in it, but anyway, that's right. Really you funny. know, they do that. Uh, there's like Jackie Chan movies and stuff that yeah. famously have women on the cover that aren't in the movie, and so I just kind of took it like, wow, I'm like now I'm at the level of Jackie Chan. Right now. Like, <laughs> that's awesome. Now, in working with you on the Danger Element, which you now I'm happy to say that it's been bought and sold. Hey guys, again, everybody, it's on Amazon. I'll be giving links below on this, all the information. But if you guys do a big favor, click on Amazon and watch the movie. It is amazing for what he did for like next to nothing on that money. But when I did some research on you, you've been, before Danger Element, I saw you on a thing called Sock Baby. I saw you on, um, was it, was it Sock Baby? And then there was another thing called Go, uh, Go Suki. Oh, Go Sukashi. Go, yeah. Go Sukashi. And like, those alone just stand alone are crazy elements and you're fighting. You're doing spectacular martial arts. And I'm like, wait a minute, that is not something you just did over the weekend. How did you how did you get into martial arts? Well, I, I I've always been interested in, in that kind of stuff, uh, just from watching movies. Mm -hmm. Like I remember uh, when, when Blade came out. Oh uh, right? it's, yeah. your friend directed Blade. Uh, yes, it was uh, Steve Norrington. Uh, that movie came out and it was pretty early on the kind of like fighting that you see in movies today where right. it's like martial arts but fast paced and there's no hesitation between the moves and, and it's funny you say that because people don't understand that that like people like oh yeah fight movies like no 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 you watch early American fight movies and you could pause and wait when somebody punch, you could, it looks it looks fake and it always looks yeah. fake for the longest time and it wasn't until uh, the Matrix showed up and then Matrix Blade like the choreography and the pacing like it looks like they're really fighting yeah, they, they did something. Blade, I think, was the first time I really saw it. And it might just be because uh, maybe I'm a little bit too young, but I know that they were doing this stuff in Hong Kong. Right. But Blade was taking a lot of cues from Hong Kong action. So there was, like, no hesitation between the moves. Moves would move, you know, the guy would move fluidly from one move to the next, and it wouldn't look like he was, you know. Take it's like break. if you were watching, like, a Van Damme movie, Van Damme would do a martial art move, and then it would there'd be, like, It'd be like sectioned out, like you do the move and stop, and then do another <laughs> move and stop. You know that kind of thing. Right. Or like you do a roundhouse, and that'd be amazing, but then you would stop. <laughs> and 
that I think is where I kind of started getting super interested in that idea. And, and the thing is, I learned I worked on a film with Steve Wang. He did a thing called Come for Rascals, and the one of the things they did was that they would choreograph the, they would do these fight scenes and uh, rehearse it really well. Like, bam, 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 and they'd shoot it and they would crank it up. Yeah, yeah. Just a couple, like a couple frames, like a couple more speed up just a tad not too much look fake but just enough to make it look just that much more fluid did you do any of that when you were doing angel did it, it? Did, uh, first a, a question about did you work on kung fu rap rascals yes i did uh they they shot that on film yes for sure. yeah super so, eight so they would do that by uh in post they would under crank the, you'd, you, you'd have to yeah, do yeah, that yeah 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 you'd under crank it yeah. yeah so like you'd shoot the film a little bit slow right so that when you played it back it, it was a little bit faster right. I do the same thing, except now it's digital, so it's a lot easier. Yeah, it is. I, I usually push it about 10%. And, 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 it, it, and even being well choreographed, it still looks amazingly fast. Because yeah. so, you want to get rid of you want to get rid of the hesitation. You don't want it to be too fast because it needs to have weight. Right. But uh, you also, when it's too slow, it doesn't feel right either. There's somewhere in between. When I mean, you're trying not to hit the guy, hit the guy <laughs> so you, you lose something there. So you want, you're trying to get it back by pushing the speed a little bit. Right. Uh, I noticed, but you did a thing you looked very young in, and that was Sock Baby. Who who did Sock Baby? How did, how did that come together? How did you get in that thing? Well, that was super weird because I was already making stuff back in Modesto. Right. Just, I, I had made like a 45-minute action movie that was pretty bad. Okay. But, it, I mean, obviously, but <laughs> you might even think my stuff now is bad, but I'm just saying, like, comparatively. Right. It was pretty bad, but the fighting was pretty good. Right. And there's this uh, comic book artist uh, co that came from the same area, but he was he was down here in LA at the time, and he saw something I was doing. His name was Doug Tenable, right? And he saw that stuff I was doing, and he's like, "Let's make something." So he wrote something quickly, like in an evening, and that was Sock Baby. And he drew all the characters and everything. And Justin and I, back home in in Modesto, tried to matches we we created all the costumes and everything trying to match his designs and everything and i was already into martial arts movies right i think the matrix had come out by right. that time so that was started the hong kong stuff was really starting to come in i was watching jet lee and so i was like okay well i'm going to use this as my platform to do all these experiments and i didn't ever take a martial arts class or anything i was just i just like practiced like on my own and and, I, and then just watched movies and tried to emulate things. And so Sock Baby was like my big experiment where I got to try all these things. There was really no restriction on anything. So I got to do whatever I wanted. So when you, I've seen you swing on a pair of nunchucks, which is the two pieces of short wood with a chain between it and John would spin them around. Do you do that really effortlessly? Uh, did you pick that up? Did somebody train you? Did you just watch again watch movies? I just practiced for a long time. And you know, weird, it's weird. There's not a lot of examples in movies of that, I don't think. I not think. Yeah, Bruce Lee, early stuff. But yeah, it's like you can't. But he's 90 miles an hour. Like, yeah. Sure, sure. yeah so, as I would look at Bruce Lee, but you, it's weird. You can't learn a lot by watching a guy do it for some reason. It doesn't. No. It just doesn't translate well. But yeah, it was just a lot of accidentally hitting myself. And and then eventually I got to the point where I kind of didn't do that anymore. You know, it's a very weird. It's a weird weapon. Okay, like, I, I want to. I actually really want to feature it in the in the future. I want to do it on screen. I don't know that I'm good enough yet, but okay. it's getting there. So you did sock baby, and that was absurd. It was crazy. Now go. And people loved it. It was yeah, a, I, like a global thing that happened. It was before YouTube. And so wait, so if it was before YouTube, who's, how were they seeing it? There's, there, it still exists, I think, but these guys, uh, Dan Harmon and Rob Schraub, had started this monthly competition, like film competition, right? where you'd make like a five-minute short. It was called Channel 101. So when we made that, Doug was like, we're going to submit this to Channel 101, and it's going to be on the Internet. And it's kind of funny because I didn't really have a concept of uploading things to the internet. Right. I was like, why would you... I was putting movies on the internet. I was like, I thought that was dumb. I was like, we were going to show this to people, you know? It, it didn't make any sense to me. Anyway, we did that, and it ended up becoming this sort of global thing. Like, people all over the world knew what it was. Uh, there were even... There were some... Like, Jim Henson Company at one point was interested in doing a movie out of it, and we were kind of talking to them a little bit. Wow. It was super weird, like... Because it just, there was just, it was right at the right time. There was nothing else like it, you know? And so, but, 
so people kind of knew about that. Right. And and it, Dunn Jones is in, in them as well, isn't he? Yeah, we did a fourth. We did three of those with kind of nobody know, knowing who we were. Right. Never think we were just doing it for fun, and right. then it became big. And then, like five years later or something, um, we did a fourth one, and Doug Jones was in it, and I had met him. I think the year earlier at, right. at Comic Con, and we were already talking about doing Danger Element. Right. And so you were gearing up for Danger. Yeah. So we we're like, well, let's just like have some fun together and see how that feels. And then, right. and then we did Danger Element. He was in that. But yeah, it was just a crazy road. I mean, that was just those things cost literally zero to make. Yeah, and, and there. And if you guys get a chance, I'll have links for these below the videos. That the, the, they're insane. Uh, now. Go Sukaki. What was I just saying that correctly? Uh, Go Sukashi. Go Sukashi. Now that is a Japanese player. Is that actually a Japanese character? Yeah, it's a it's a pro it's a Japanese product. Um, the product. There was well, it's yeah, it's like an IP. When I talk about this, it's very confusing because I'm already but this here. Let's go. Because um, okay, so it was the same guy that created Sock Baby contacted me right and was like, you know, he has these. Japanese business partners that own this thing and they came to him about the possibility of kind of reinventing it for an internet audience right. and for and for particularly an American audience right and it was this they just you know brought it to us and just kind of put it in front of us it's like very confusing and it's this character that has like a his, we figured out his head is supposed to be a sand dollar yeah yeah I figured that and, and, and the thing is so funny about it too is he fights these dimensional beings it's got a lot of humor it's it's intentionally funny you guys get a chance off links watch them they're intentionally funny and that you said that um it could they were possibly going to blossom to something bigger and again it just the bottom dropped out about it as well too. that was what they were hoping for uh we couldn't i mean it was like we we heavily reinvented the whole mythos of the character right and the visual effects of the things that are, are spectacular who's doing all these visual effects for this thing it was amazing it was some of the same people that worked on a uh, danger element later. I mean, right. we, we were always, always gearing up towards a danger element. Right. And which is the feature I did. But right. It, That's on Amazon. <laughs> we were always gearing up towards that. So right. I had a whole crew of people that I had been talking to for like a decade. You know? Right. Like, like I met, there was this animation guy that I met that was out in Boston. Mm -hmm. And he, he went into visual effects later right. and he, and then he came out here and then we ended up hiring him to do logos and, and the facts and all this stuff, and then that eventually went into Danger Element, where he did the logos and the big special effects sequences, and there were lots of people like that that were just kind of around. We had built up sort of. Yeah, yeah you. That's a, yeah, when you're making working in the industry, you start collecting friends and stuff, yeah. and you always keep them like, oh, if I do this, I want to keep you in the the circle and things. That's excellent. There were yeah, like animate. There were two. There was a two D two uh, D animation guy that would do animated sequences and stuff because we liked. That Sock Baby had this animation sequence. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know that we ever rose to. The, I, I was that was like hand. The one in, in Sock Baby was hand drawn on paper. Like it's, wow. this guy Mike Beats, who's still doing this. They just released a. He just released a, a video game called Arma Croc. It's okay. like a stop motion video game. All right, can't tell. I'll have to make sure to put links for that. Awesome. But he he did all that like by hand on paper. So the first time I saw the animation, it was like you could literally see the fibers of the paper. Uh, and we always, I always loved that, so I always was trying to do it again. Later, it was done with like flash, right? Yeah, because yeah, it's it's faster and easier. You know, and, yeah, and much, much it, more efficient. He was like, we were kind of beyond the point of asking favors, you know. So <laughs> you had to pay a little bit, and it had to be done cheaply. So then it would end up being something like flash. So now with this venture, you went on this journey. You self-taught, pulled your team together. You made this amazing movie called The Danger Element, which. Of all, you, for me, I, I did the same thing. I shot a film years ago, and we went to the struggles making it, and we sold it, and went to, like, Netflix and Blockbuster, and then, like... And it's, the, it's cool. And it's, it's cool, people. and it's exciting. Thank you. But then once it's done, it's kind of like, boop, gone. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it has its peak, then it's gone. And after that, I was like, you know something? I'm done. That was a lot of work. But you, sir, are all geared up to do another film. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I went through the same thing. I, when I got Danger Element finished, I went through the whole process of having to provide all the materials for when it was sold and all right. that. And, yeah, did the same thing. And I was really burnt out on yeah, it. Yeah, exhausted. I, I didn't think I would go back into it, but then 
few a few months passed, and I obviously you can't keep yourself from coming up with ideas, you know. And then eventually, I wrote a script. And it was a well, I wrote a script years before, but I was rewriting it. Mm -hmm. And then I eventually got to the point where I'm like, well, I have to make this now. Right. And that's kind of where I am now. Uh, I'm going to try like a diff little bit different approach. I'm going to try to fund it through Kickstarter. Okay. I'm going to try to do it on a little bit smaller scale so that I can <laughs> you know, not spend a quarter of my lifetime working it is, on it. I've, I've said that too. I'm like, I want to do something that's low budget. And you write something low budget. And as you start developing, you start realizing, oh, well, maybe it wasn't as low budget as I thought it would be. But I love the fact, and is there a title to this film? Uh, it's called Book of Lies. Book of Lies. And it, yeah, it's it's the same character. It's a we're kind of developing the character a little bit further, kind of mm -hmm. reinventing. It's the same character from Danger Element, uh, but I think it, it's going to stand on its own. It's going to be like a little bit more of a, an accessible adventure story mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And the reason I bring it up is because uh, I'm excited about it, and I'm going to be working on it as well. I'm going to be doing some stuff. Um, I don't know, maybe some props. We'll see. Costume. Well, no, we'll see. I can talk too much about it. But uh, John's going to be doing a Kickstarter in the soon, guys. Again, so I'll have all the information below the video for this, so definitely keep it, keep it in mind. Uh, this is a segment where we sip our coffee. Quickly, John, grab your coffee. Mmm, coffee. We're going to take questions from the live stream right now. We're doing we're doing this live on twitch.tv slash evil that Smith. We do this on Saturdays. This is my day to do this. So we're going to take some chat. So everybody who's in chat, if you guys have questions for John... We'd like to get down to it. Ask him. Mm. John, what do you think will be the biggest challenge in your new film? Uh, I was just talking to my wife about this yesterday. Um, I, I think probably just getting myself to believe that I can <laughs> get out. You know what I mean? It's like I've done this once and I learned a lot from it. And then I kind of stopped for a while, and it, I don't think you lose those skills, but it, it's definitely going to be a different feeling, you know, like getting out there in front of a camera and yeah, things like I, that. Yeah, I tell you what, being I, I also made a film, and one thing I'll tell you, it's a, it's muscle memory, and as you start getting back into it, you'll get into it, and you'll catch your dude, you're like, dang it, I know better than that. And, yep. you, and all that happens is once or twice, and it, but it's, it'll, it'll take, you'll get back into it, it'll come right back like riding a bike. It'll come back to you. I'm, I'm oh, wait, here we go. Um... John, when you were doing the serial thing with Danger Element, it it forced you to do uh, what's that? Continuity production. Production is that like right? Like making them in, in an order. Oh, that's right. And the challenge did you did that pose? Uh, did the, oh, the challenge pose that process. Like it it yeah I, it did um, it did force me to release the things in order. Right. Which was very, very difficult. Because, because when you shoot something, we're at this location, but this happens later. But yeah, yeah. I would shoot stuff that would that was scheduled to happen much more. If I was at a, at, a, at a location that we came back to in the very last scene of the movie, I shot that scene. Right. Like, the, the scene at the, there's a scene at the very end of Danger Element when, when Billiard goes back to his boss and they have this conversation. Right. That scene was one of the very first things we shot. And it was in 2007. It was, it was before the funding got pulled. Right. And it was the end of the movie. So nobody saw that for years. You know, I think the thing came out last year. So that would be the first time. It, it was 10 years later. Wow. Yeah, so that, it, he caused huge problems. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was a mess. Like, that's absolutely true. Very insightful. Hey, Studio G7. Uh, hyper, hyper the logic is, John, how did you get into making films? I just kind of started. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we did early. We uh, he did, he watched. Um, for your people who are late to chat, uh, late to our stream, uh, yeah, he did. He he got into um, movies that inspired you. The cool thing about John, when you watch the uh, after this video, you watch the links and stuff, that it's self-taught. He didn't go to school for this, and that was one thing I when I first met John. Like, Do you want to? Nope. I just learned from watch. I call it Quentin Tarantino school making and filmmaking. Like, I I was in a. I was in a film class oh, at, at, at Modesto Junior College, you know, uh, which is also mentioned in American Graffiti. It's really funny, like all the things that are mentioned in that movie that are connected to stuff that I did. But that's how George went, right? But I didn't do the thing about. You technically should say that I didn't. I, I think that the school likes me to say that I did, <laughs> but like <laughs> I bet they do. The problem is I I didn't really cooperate. 
uh, very well with any, anything. I didn't do the assignments the way that they wanted them done. I just kind of did whatever I wanted. And my instructor, my instructor uh, Carol Mingus, was very accommodating in that way. She would give me passing grades, uh, but I wasn't doing what she told me to do. You know, she'd be like, "This movie's got to be under five minutes," and she'd make me redo things, right. and it would still be twelve minutes long. And she's like, <laughs> "But it's real. It's good. You're doing a great job." So, and you know, eventually she actually kicked me out. She kicked me out of the film program because she's just like, "Look, if this is what you're going to do, like you can do it on your own time." And, and it actually kind of jump started my my career jumping out there and trying to do stuff on my own and that's how oh, I good for, her. good for her she but in other words, she saw the potential of you and said well you can't really follow these rules within this class so get out and just make movies yeah well and I think she was like you know if you're not going to figure it out here you'll figure it out there where nobody's going to pay you if you do this kind of crap you know like that right. sort of thing and it totally were I met her later on and it was great it was like we I totally understood it at that point and and she was proud of what I had done yeah, one of the dirty secrets of filmmaking is that you totally don't have to go to school to learn it, especially now, suggesting people start <laughs> studying that way. It's true. It's uh, Makeup schools and film schools are abundancy out here, and people, t they take your money. I really don't think you need, I mean, it's, there's, here's the thing. If you want to be a director of photography, uh, you want to be a DP, director of photography, you got to know the equipment. And I think a school could teach you how to handle the equipment, uh, audio visual like doing audio and sound you need to have access to the equipment there's certain aspects but as being a director and a writer i don't really think you need school for that as much as you just do by doing and learning the, so. yeah the the word need in, in terms of school for film is uh, it's a little bit much because it even if you get like a degree in communications or something like in film or whatever right. i would say that would, might help you get a job out here in la or something but not, I don't think you'd get a job directing. Basically, my the whole reason I made my film was I figured out that nobody was going to let me do this <laughs> unless I did it. There's a yeah, there's a weird kind of like cross pollination thing that happens where like I couldn't get a regular job in the industry. Like I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't get a job as an editor, right? But then I made my own film and that got me a job as an editor. But as an editor that doesn't get me a job as a director, director right. right? So I have, you know, it's like I have to kind of go in these different. And I didn't go to, I didn't get a degree or anything like that. So it's, it's a very weird path. John, who else would be working on this project? Uh, Ted, that's me. Uh, I'll be working on it. My composer, uh, Glenn Gabriel. Oh my gosh, a, he's amazing. Yeah, he's. A, I mean, he's this great composer out in Sweden who who did the whole score for the for my last movie. That was way better than it deserved to be. Yeah, the, the production value and the music is, is, is breathtaking. And a lot of the same people. I, I have a, a friend in, in stunts out in Atlanta. Her name is uh, Elizabeth Davidovich. Right. She's uh, most likely going to be the stunt coordinator. And I've never had a stunt coordinator before. <laughs> so that's, I'm like really into that idea. Like somebody who's in charge of like making that stuff work instead of me just going out and throwing myself in you know, in front of a car or something yeah, like the, that. Yeah, that would be That's very funny. <laughs> Will the movie be produced in California? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, there's a... It's pretty early right now, uh, but I think there's a couple of things that I would like to shoot out of state. If you had a bunch... It's, it's like... It, yeah, if you have, because it's, it's a weird threshold where if you have a lot of money, you can do it, but if you have little money, you can't travel. Traveling is expensive. The only reason Hollywood does it is because the money they save is, is enormous. It's yeah. in, huge. In production. Like in when production. they get into production wherever they're going, it costs less than having it here. Right. Whereas in my case, that will likely be the opposite. Like right. travel will be an expense that we just can't exactly. deal with. Right. But, it, you know, I, if I can get enough money together, I, I might go to Colorado or something like that but I've, I've purposely set it up where most of it will be shot in California yeah and then besides because I I want to work on it and I'm old and I want to travel <laughs> so it will be somewhat close it'll be awesome there was a point where it was possibly going to be shot in Sweden and it that, was a very different story and that was because you had uh, Swedish investors right there and we, we like had friends out there and there was a lot of interest they like they brought me out uh, my, my composer's out there, so him and his wife and their and his manager and stuff, they brought me out to Sweden for a week, and I just got like this kind of star treatment in Sweden. I met everybody and met all these people who were totally willing to work, and 
And, and they were like ready to go. The streets were open to me. It's like you could go out there and shoot in the streets and medieval buildings and catacombs and everything. But the, it's just, um, I still want to do it, but probably not on this project. Was it, was it, did, was it, they had momentum, but did, did you not have the project ready to go? Or was it, what was the, I, I had a script, uh, I think it was just kind of not knowing where to go. It was like, they'd never made, they'd never made a film before. Okay, so these are first time investors. And, and then, like, I was kind of not into, I had just, sort, I was in the middle of finishing Danger Element, and I wasn't <laughs> into doing a lot of uh, infrastructure stuff, like, uh, you know, business type stuff right, right. it was it was hurting my head you know so I, I feel like it's probably that's still going to happen but just not on this project it needs to be a simpler project I think that I can kind of kind of run myself a little easier with their help but yeah I'd still love to do it yeah fantastic how will the new movie be cast since it's an independent uh, production uh, most of it most of it either has been cast or I know who I want. Uh, and it's just people that I've worked with before. And, you know, every once in a while I'll try to reach out to somebody else. But yeah, I haven't gotten to the point where I can just get anybody I want yet. I, I got Doug Jones in Danger Element by... It, they, he was with Guillermo del Toro promoting uh, Pan's Labyrinth. I think it was like 2006. Right. At, at Comic-Con. And I got in line. I literally got in line for an autograph. <laughs> and I met Guillermo, and that was cool. And then Doug, I had, like, sort of demo stuff with me. Right. And he was, like, super interested in that. And he just started asking me questions. And then we kept talking after that. And then he, he literally was like, I, I want to work with you on something. And that's how I got him. I didn't go through any proper channels to get him. I, yeah, because because in reality, if you want Doug Jones to move, you just can't. Yeah, there, you know, it won't happen. Now, for sure. I mean, no, he's even he, he's on Star Trek. He's in the new Star Trek. He he went with me out to Modesto to do the the my hometown screening of Danger Element, which was super generous of him. But we talked about this film, and he's he's like, I'm I'm super interested in doing it. The only problem is I don't know. If I'll have time, Cause right? Because now he's playing a main character. What's, it's a it's a new what's the new Star Trek called? Star Trek Discovery. Did, so yeah, he's, and he plays and it. then plus the uh, the Shape of Water won a uh, won Best Picture at the Oscars. Oh, that's right. So now he's like kind of blowing up a little bit. So he's like <laughs> he's like I I totally want to do it, but he's like I might not have time. So yeah, that's the kind of stuff you run into. John, who are you? Who are your biggest film and TV digital influences? Directors, actors, and writers, etc. Uh, obviously, Indiana Jones. He's not a person, but he's a film character. Right. <laughs> but the the Indiana Jones franchise, Star Wars franchise, all that stuff that happened when I was a kid. Uh, Matt, the Mad Max franchise. I'm gigantically influenced by that. You know, George George Miller went on to do like Happy Feet after that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. I, um, so, as for so for directors, some of your give me some of your directors. I mean, like Spielberg. Uh, George Miller for sure yeah. even though he did movies I don't watch like I didn't watch Happy Feet I, it was a weird it was so strange to me the, the crazy huge leap he made to, to a different kind of movie but like yeah Spielberg um, Guillermo del Toro it, I, I love the way that he works and the way that he thinks and, any, any Cameron any Jim definitely yeah Terminator 2 that's that was one of the big ones that I was about 10 years old when that came out mm -hmm. and I watched the tape so many times that I I wore out the tape and it broke, and, you, and I dismantled it <laughs> and, and put the tape. I fixed, repaired it, and then started watching it again. Like that was one that that really sealed the deal for me. Where I was like, I'm definitely making movies. Because yeah, T two T two is amazing. It still holds up. It's a brilliant film. It's such a. I mean, I can't even. I can't speak highly enough about that movie. Everybody, guys, this again was my special guest, John Soares. He has the movie, The Danger Element. He made himself it's now on Amazon definitely go check it out Amazon is it Amazon Prime or just Amazon right? no, Amazon uh, you, Prime. Can, you can rent it on Amazon but if you have Amazon Prime it's free see there you guys go so you can watch you see all you people out there with Amazon Prime give John this movie a watch like it tell your friends about it uh, everybody if you guys watch this don't forget to uh, subscribe to the channel also you can go to my website eveltedsmith.com get on my um, mailing list and I'll keep you informed when I do another coffee talk John, thanks for coming on and hanging out so much. It was thanks, a blast. Thanks for having me, man. Thank you. Woo, guys. <laughs> thank you so much for watching. I will catch you back next time right here on Coffee Talk. No big whoop. Bye. <laughs>